This is the hardest video I've ever had to make. When I started this project over a year ago, I had hopes of getting answers to 45-year-old questions. What was he thinking and feeling in all these images I'm seeing and hearing on my screen? And thanks to this letter, and some very generous people who chose to join me on this, I got answers to those questions, except for one. I heard a boom, but I, you know, I didn't pay much attention to it. I was working on a pickup truck and... Uh... What was he thinking and feeling at 10.38 a.m., April 25th, 1979? And I just looked up in the sky and saw it come down? Well, just looking out normal, the plane just kind of come right down in front of me, and I just, I just happened to see it. And then the universe stepped in. A complete stranger and subscriber messaged me and explained that he remembered the accident from his childhood and that his father was involved in the investigation. Retired Major George Konersk agreed to sit down with me and share his memories of the incident and the investigation and the process. He answered my question. This is that conversation. Thanks for joining me on this journey. It is my pleasure to welcome Major George Knersk to the channel. Good afternoon, sir. I think it's appropriate that you're joining me here on Memorial Day weekend. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. My pleasure to do this, yes. I'm so grateful to, to have this conversation with you. And uh, I apologize for the goofy glasses I no. have on. I had some uh, um, cataracts removed. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't don't apologize, sir. It's, it's fine. No problem. A quick introduction of you. Went to Arizona State uh, University, uh, ROTC there. From there, uh, uh, pilot training at Williams Air Force Base. And uh, from there, uh, into the F-4. Uh, and uh, and then from there, down to Homestead Air Force Base, where we went through uh, uh, RTU for the uh, F-4. And then pipeline direct to Southeast Asia from there. And flew out of uh, Da Nang for a year. Flew uh, 330 sorties, combat sorties. Wow. The mission out of there was uh, interdiction uh, along roadways and uh, close air support. Which, uh, yeah, I ended up with uh, uh, quite a few uh, um, uh, medals on my chest. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, luckily enough, I uh, never injured. So uh, Purple Heart was avoided, and I'm happy about that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so tell me a little bit about how your your road uh, in the Air Force led you to working on the acceptance side of the F-15 program with McDonnell Douglas. Um, I was uh, going to go to a staff job and uh, my boss in uh, St. Louis uh, found me rotating out of Taiwan and having been uh, working with a contractor had the knowledge of uh, of how that operates sure. and the flight test type stuff that we did on the airplanes there after the maintenance was complete. So that led right into going to Mac Air. So what, I ended up- what, what year was that when you first started? That was, uh, I got to Mac Air the first working day in 1977. Can you talk a little bit about the program? Uh, the interaction there is the government flight rep makes sure that the contractor follows the contract that he has with the government. Sure. So they they fly the airplanes properly. They have a, a system, and their system is is uh, looked over by the GFR. And we say, yep, that's all uh, good for the airplane and what the government wants that airplane to be like when it when it gets delivered to the to the fleet. And the contractor's responsibility is to put airworthiness flight on the airplane. So the first flight of that airplane is always done by uh, the contractor. Late 1978, and you start to see, again in the logbook here, regular entries in both F-15As and F-15Bs. That probably was uh, uh, some rides to uh, uh, show him the profiles and, uh, and uh, get him comfortable in the aircraft. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all told, there's um, a handful of flights in 78, and then it appears in, in early January of 1979, that's when he was picked up officially for a production test pilot. Did you uh, ever have a chance to meet him? Did you Do you recall? Or... I, I met him on, on occasion. Okay. Um, usually it was, uh, he's coming downstairs, I'm going upstairs, uh -huh. you know, and say hi, that kind of thing. Or he might have been in a meeting that I was in. Sure. So yes, I, I, uh, I knew uh, 
uh, who he was and uh, was sat in meetings with him. I sit down across the table and chit chat or have him fly chase for me or me chase for him. Can you remember anything funny or just that made an impression on you about his personality in any of these meetings that you can recall? Oh, I mean, he was always uh, a, uh, a very generous person, uh, ready to chat and talk about uh, systems or uh, life or whatever, you know. Uh, and most of the time it was a systems type stuff that, uh, that we, uh, we chatted about. On uh, April 25th, 1979, approximately 9.30 in the morning, Captain Mad Duck Kincaid departed Mac Air at St. Louis Lambert International Airport in an F-15B. The bureau number was 77-0167. Uh, this was the second production test flight of this airplane, and it was considered a routine production flight. Uh, nothing special about it. I, I think, as you mentioned, that the... the the main goal of this flight was a high-speed mock run to uh, above Mach 2 to kind of, you know, shake things out. They headed uh, to the Lindbergh A MOA, which is southeast of St. Louis. Um, that was the assigned test flight for that day. And as far as I can tell and we know, everything went according to the plan um, until approximately 10.38 a.m. And Mac Air lost communication with him. Well, the uh, explosion I heard, I just thought it was another sonic boom is what I thought. And uh, then I seen the uh, plane, the fuselage, come down over there and it hit the ground and it was just smoke and fire is all it was. Uh, the main body of the impact landed in a farm field just southwest of Fredericktown, Missouri. Can you talk about that? Can wh What did you guys know from your side once you got involved in the investigation and and does that seem to jive with all the data and everything that you, you knew? So in the case that you're talking about, um, I don't remember. I did review the HUD film in that, that uh, speed run. Mm -hmm. We all sat around a table and looked at it, you know, to see what we could see about what was going on. Um, of course, that was uh, uh, classified data at the time. And uh, I don't remember... Uh, uh, what altitude the airplane was at when the incident occurred. Um, and I don't remember what, uh, uh, what the uh, indicated airspeed was either. But I do remember there's a, a G meter on the HUD, okay, that shows um, alpha. At the time that the uh, uh, that electrical uh, contact in the cockpit disappeared, there was a a definite uh, nose down moment, but at about uh, one negative G mm -hmm. is where it all stopped. So uh, at that time frame, uh, there was uh, a, a horrendous negative G that went on the, the cockpit area. And what caused it, I'm still not sure to today what caused it. When they lost radar contact with the airplane and we looked at the films of the uh, of the ground control radar. It followed a debris field. The engines actually came out the top of the airplane and went uh, almost two miles or three miles down track mm -hmm. from where the uh, the debris field of the aircraft landed. You could actually see them on uh, uh, FAA radar uh, as a you know, couple of black dots that were still being traced by the, by the radar. So it was uh, a tremendous, uh, um, negative G input from something. Within minutes, probably 15, 20 minutes, Mac Air had uh, um, rented the helicopter. It, it landed on the, on the pad there at uh, um, Mac Air. Have you been able to preserve the integrity of the scene without any problems here? Well, we're having troubles because uh, we have wreckage all over the place and we're trying to uh, uh, get guards on the, on the parts that we think might tell us something. What was the name of the guy that your, your uh, dad worked for? Yeah, uh, uh, I, um, and, I, and I can see his face, uh, R.D. Yeah. Hunt. R.D. Hunt, great gentleman. Yeah. yeah. Over how wide an area is the wreckage spread? Several, Several miles. So that does tell you disintegration in the air. Yeah, right, most definitely. Yeah, he was, he was there. Uh, their uh, safety expert and okay. uh, chief of their flight safety, yeah. yeah. Have you been able to uh, 
from what you found here at the scene determine what might have happened? No, not at all. We're, we're, we spent most of the time trying to find a pilot, and unfortunately we found him in the seat. So all we know is that he, he didn't leave the seat, and we don't know why the airplane uh, had his problem. For what things look like on the heads-up display and, and uh, what they figure happened, he had absolutely no idea what hit him. Yeah. He was, he was here one second and gone the next. That was, that was it. Didn't have a chance. Yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, Thank you. But, uh, you know, it was just, uh, yeah. And Jack was totally 100% right about that. Yeah. You know? Thank you. No doubt. Yeah. 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 I told myself I wasn't going to do that, but... Hey, that's all right. <laughs> you know, it's been so long, and it's just been a part of my life, But and it's something you get used to, but you never get used to it. <laughs> no. I hate no. to say that, but uh, it's true. Uh, we fly, we've flown a lot of hours with the airplane, and uh, obviously we don't have that kind of problem every day. It's uh, an unusual sort of thing to happen. I don't think we've ever had anything like this happen. It was quite a long yeah. investigation from what I remember as a child. It was quite prolonged. Oh, yeah. And and I believe the reason why, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, for a while they were quite baffled. They didn't know exactly what had happened. They I think they ruled out um, pilot error pretty quickly because of the suddenness of it. The two things that we were told as a family, possibly a fuel leak. The second theory that they were chasing was potentially an accidental deployment of the rear ejection seat system, not the ejection seat itself, but the inflatables that are part of that ejection seat. If I have this right, there's right. a life raft underneath the ejection exactly. seat. Exactly, yes. And uh -huh. for whatever reason, that life raft discharged, it, it pushed the aft stick forward, which would cause the pitch over, sudden pitch over. Maybe talk a little bit about the duration of the investigation and then some of the things that you did from the Air Force side uh, particularly in a simulator. Sure. The, uh, uh, my, myself and uh, a gentleman from that care named Pat Henry. I don't know if that yes, name is. Yes, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, family friend. Uh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. So Pat and I uh, uh, took uh, TF number two, two seat F-15, flew over to right Pat, and uh, met up with the simulation folks. Um, they had the sim rigged up so they could fail different portions of the airplane. I mean, they could have a wing fall off. They could have two wings fall off at the same time. Mm -hmm. They could lose the ailerons all at the same time. They could have gear come down and uh, do stuff. They could have one stabilizer go full up, one stab go full oh, down. Yeah. They could, uh, they could rig it to go uh, full uh, aileron left, full aileron right. Uh, at all kinds of different airspeeds. If you saw something happening, could you uh, regain control of the airplane yes. due to the malfunction that they threw in? Yes. And about, I'd say, better than 90% of the malfunctions they threw at us, there was no way we could control mm. the airplane. Yeah. What would cause that to happen, a uh, full deflection of, of stabilizer, et cetera, didn't seem to uh, to break the airplane up or put it into uh, over G in mm -hmm. negative structural uh, failure. Structural right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But between Pat and myself, we basically said it could not have happened due to uh, flight control failures. Okay, mm -hmm. so it had to have been something else that mm -hmm. that uh, that happened to that machine. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, uh, it's never happened again mm -hmm. to an F-15. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. particular creature was there was something wrong with it. Yeah. No one could tell us that he did anything wrong, but they couldn't tell us what went wrong. I think that's what I'm hearing from you today, that um, in the end, they still don't know what happened to that airplane. I, I, I thoroughly believe that. And I do believe that um, uh, if, if the raft in that seat had uh, deployed, uh, I think we did maneuvers in the simulation that that uh, would have put enough force on on the on the stick yeah. to to do the same basic thing. Okay, you know? so that that would tend to indicate maybe their that their leading theory on a fuel leak or something 
causing an explosive event may be that the most very, likely cause. That very well yeah. could have been, certainly. Yeah. 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 Now, I, and I would think that by looking over the uh, uh, the wreckage, you could tell whether there was uh, uh, an explosive flame or whatever uh, in the areas of the uh, fuel tanks. Uh, okay. There's always enough of that left over, you know, to see. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, my my theory, <laughs> which isn't worth a hoot, it means, okay, it means something is, to me, sir. So please, is, share. is that uh, is that either there was a structural uh, frame breakup of some kind okay. um, that uh, uh, separated the cockpit area from the main portion of the uh, uh, airframe. Well, look, George, it's been great catching up with you today. I so appreciate your time and your willingness to sit down and talk to, honestly, a complete stranger that your uh, son met on the Internet through my YouTube channel. I can't explain it. I just I, I firmly believe that the wor world and the universe works in a certain way. And Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. And uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping I added a few uh, odds and ends to uh, uh, to what you needed to, to know and find out or, you know, I confirmed some things for you that uh, that were, were, were useful. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you did, sir. And uh, I will tell you, this is uh, this is the one question that I accepted that I would never get answers to in my life. And you've answered those questions. And for that, I will be internally grateful to you, sir. So God bless you and your family. And, and thank you again for your time and your service to our country. Thank You're you, sir. absolutely welcome. Thank, thank you. you. When I look out the window, I only see my reflection. No memory crescendo. No past your possession. Where did all the fire time go? Like a ladder with no bottom Each wrong passing below I've already forgot them When the rain comes tomorrow And the sun peeks through small cracks And I'll see you echo of a sound I can't get back where did all the far time go what is it that we don't know missing there is no hope in photos if I can't remember the feelings within it I'm trying to find my Wow.